Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of our virtual fashion symposium. I'm Allison Tolman, the Vice President of Collections and Interpretation at the Maryland Center for History and Culture, and your MC for the next few days. Like so much of our programming, we had hoped that this fashion symposium could be in person, so we could actually see all of you and tour the spectrum of fashion exhibition and even peek behind the scenes. While we can't get together in person, we are so thrilled that all of our amazing speakers could join us virtually so we can still dive into some fashion history together. April Callahan, as you know, will be speaking today, and tomorrow we will be having a panel on sustainable fashion moderated by Dr. Victoria Pass. We hope that you can make all of our programs. If you missed Dr. Jonathan Michael Square's talk yesterday, or you can join us tomorrow, we will be posting our videos online findable through our new website. You can visit us at mdhistory.org and check out our video archive. It's hard to believe that our Spectrum of Fashion exhibition opened a year ago. If you haven't been able to see it yet, it will be up through the end of this year. And if you aren't able to visit us, I highly recommend grabbing the Spectrum of Fashion book from our museum store. It has nearly 100 garments with stunning detail shots and four essays that take deep dives into our collection and uncover new stories. We've discounted the catalog for our attendees to the symposium and we hope that you enjoy it. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, April Callahan. April, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Hello everyone. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that you have invited me. <laughs> we're, we're thrilled to have you here. So yeah. for everyone who doesn't know, April Callahan is a fashion historian, a writer, and a professional podcaster living and working in New York City. She serves as a special collections associate at the FIT Libraries Special Collections and College Archives. Her work as a fashion historian has been featured in Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, that's the UK, India, and Serbia editions. Which it's always really fun when you get those ones. You were like, <laughs> when you get like the Serbia. <laughs> uh, as well as Women's Wear Daily, Architectural Digest, The Business of Fashion, and Bitch Magazine. Her speaking engagements include guest lectures at cultural institutions around the world, including the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Yale University, the National Gallery of Victoria Melbourne, and Parsons School of Design. Among her many accomplishments, April is the author of Fashion Plates, 150 Years of Style. Uh, we keep a copy of this on hand in the Fashion Archives because it is a wonderful tool when we're trying to date things. It has beautiful illustrated fashion plates from the 18th century through the early 20th century. I mean, it's a beautiful book, so I like to have it. Just that I have my own copy as well as one for work. And speaking of beautiful books, you should also check out uh, Fashion and the Art of Pochoir. The gold pochoir. Ah, I knew I was going to get it. <laughs> the Golden Age illustration in Paris, written by April and Cassidy Zachary. Uh, in addition to authoring and co-authoring three books on uh, history and fashion, she's also the co-creator and co-host of Breast: The History of Fashion, which is produced by iHeartRadio and is a top-ranked beauty and fashion podcast on iTunes. If you love history, fashion, or otherwise, you fashion or otherwise, I really recommend Dressed. It's fun to listen to April and Cassidy discuss like the many, many stories you can tell with clothing. Clothing. There are big stories. There are little stories. It's all. It's so amazing how you can see history through clothes. Today, April is going to talk to us about couturiers of the early 20th century. And if you visited our Spectrum of Fashion exhibit, you know we have some pretty stunning examples of that in our own collection. This is one of my personal favorite eras of clothing, and I hope you all love it too. If you have any questions during the program, please use that little Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to tackle as many as we can at the end of the talk. Now, all that said, I'm gonna turn it over to you, April, who can pronounce the French a lot better than I can, and I'll see you at the Q&A. Thank you again. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, good afternoon, everyone, and Allie, thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you to everybody at Maryland Center for History and Culture for, for inviting us, and of course, I was uh, very excited to see everybody in person and also to see the Spectrum of Fashion exhibition this past spring, but, well, we all know how that went, right, you know? Um, I'm going to go ahead and just start sharing my screen here really quick with you all. Okay, great. Um, 
So, you know, I, I, I have to say, of course, you know, like these are, these are really strange times that we're living in. Um, but I think one good thing a little bit that's come out of you, the state of things in the United States right now um, is the fact that there is this renewed public discussion on the discourse of power and the role of women within society. So today, what I thought would be really fun is to share with you um, three stories of some of the women who literally helped reshape fashion at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and, you know, and, and, and in very many ways, we still to this this very day owe some of our comfort and clothing to these designers of this particular period. Let me see here. Um, <clears throat> so the designers that we're going to talk about today are potentially slightly lesser known. Um, for instance, I'm not going to speak about Coco Chanel. Um, most of us are very familiar with her work already. Um, and, and if you any of you are out there Chanel fans, I have to say that the Palais Galliera in Paris, um, they actually had gone through a multi-year renovation and just reopened with an enormous Chanel exhibition. So if you are a Chanel fan, um, I know that most of us aren't probably just going to be popping over to Paris in the coming months to see it, but there is also a an exhibition catalog that's coming out very shortly. So, so if you are a, a Chanel fan, you can engage with that exhibition um, via the book if you're interested. So uh, today, no Chanel, but who we are going to focus on are these three ladies. We have uh, Jean Paquin, Jean Lavin, and Madeleine Vionnet. Um, and if a couple of these names ring a bell with you, it might be because two of them, Lavin and Vionnet, continue to operate as fashion brands to this very day. Um, and, and, and this is something that uh, Cassidy and I do on, try to do on Dressed is really to shine a light on where we are now vis-a-vis -vis the past. And you know, it's, it's like with so many things, it's really hard to understand um, our present without knowing, you know, specifically how we got there. Um, so before I begin to speak about the work of these three really incredible women, um, I, I'd like to tackle a small matter of terminology. Uh, so, of course, the title of this talk is Designing the Modern Woman, uh, Female Couturiers or Couturiers of the Early 20th Century. And, you know, there's one word in this title that continuously gives me personally a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> and that's this word modern, um, because that term is so pregnant with meaning and a multitude of meanings. So in the context of an art movement, um, you know, for instance, modernism with a capital M, you know, it refers to this very discrete period um, from the rise of the Industrial Revolution all the way up to the 19th century, um, up until the period just after the Second World War, for the most part. Um, but, but how we use that term modern today in a more common parlance, really it means the times that we live in currently. So there's, there's always like, that's what I'm saying. Like there's, sometimes there's a multitude of meanings when we use this term. So, you know, as if we needed more context to add to this, um, you know, it can also be used to indicate a relationship to a particular set of ideas that at that time of their development were new or even experimental in that moment. Um, and it's really this last definition that I'm going to be employing in our discussion today, because I'm going to be referring to a very specific period um, it, during the early 20th century when women radically altered the way that they had been dressing for centuries. So, you know, uh, this really kind of like got me thinking about this juxtaposition of this word modern, right? next to the word woman in the, on our lecture's title today. So, so if this term can be a little bit nebulous in its own right, you know, placing it in front of the word woman, well, that only kind of deepens things and complicates things even further. You know, if, if we're gonna go by that last, discuss, that last definition that I just discussed, you know, that it implies that she is a new or experimental woman, um, you know, if this, is, this is saying that she's pushing into new territories for her sex, but in what way and how? So 
um, you know, as a fashion historian, I think it's very important for me personally to kind of endeavor to sidestep the pitfalls of presentism. And, and when I say presentism, what I really mean is this tendency to interpret past events, um, you know, in terms of contemporary values and um, concepts today. Um, and one of the ways that we do that as historians is to really consult primary sources from the exact time period that we're looking at to, to understand, you know, how do they view this newly minted modern woman, right, to learn more about her and also what people thought of her in, in that moment of time. So fashion is obviously uh, the core of our discussion today. So my first inclination was obviously to turn to the fashion press um, to, to find out what people thought about this newly minted modern woman in this era. So uh, first I looked at the American publication Harper's Bazaar. Um, and Harper's Bazaar was actually launched in 1867. Um, but this term, modern woman, doesn't appear in the pages of Harper's Bazaar until two years later in 1869. Um, and what's really funny is that it appears in the context of satire. Um, and I got extremely excited when I found this because I love 18th and 19th century satire period, especially if it's fashion satire. Um, and, and, you know, it, a lot of times this fashion satire is also specifically about gender. Um, and, and it's my feeling that oftentimes uh, popular sentiment on a subject during these time periods of the 18th and 19th century is really best expressed through the lens of humor. Um, so unfortunately, the piece in question, um, the very first mention of the modern woman was a short story, which didn't necessarily include any images. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, show a satirical illustration from around the same time, um, just to accompany what I'm, what I'm, what I'm about to go into. Um, so here we have two ladies right? Um, they are wearing riding habits, which is what you would have been wearing when you were riding your horse. And uh, <laughs> the gist of this is that they are taming unbroken husbands, um, basically just as one would do with a horse. Um, and then there's a whole female audience above in that gallery um, um, observing this happening. So, uh, but the story when the, um, the in Harper's Bazaar from 1869, um, what it was speaking about, it was, it was talking about a journalist um, whose name was Mr. Feeble, who was hyper hypercritical of women's issues. Um, and then within this story, he's mysteriously invited to a private dinner at an elite men's club. He arrives to find the club dark. Um, and then once inside, he finds one room in this mansion or men's club, like lit with this ghostly light coming off the walls. Um, and and, and on the walls are all these portraits of deceased American luminaries. Um, some of them are including past presidents um, and their wives in these portraits. And then these portraits then confront him about his past quote, and this is a quote, um, speeches, articles, and essays in diverse magazines, newspapers, periodicals, in which the modern woman is variously declared to be extravagant, unwomanly, crack-brained, a fool, a flirt, a jilt, a jade, the cause of national extravagance, the cause of the decrease in marriages, and the cause of masculine immorality and many other frightful effects. So that is straight from 1869. Um, and so uh, basically the, the character in this story retorts that his grandmother did not behave in such manners as the modern woman. Um, only then to have two of the figures in the portraits summon the spirit of his dead grandmother. And his grandmother's ghost then proceeds to take him to task um, for his ignorance about the strength of the women of her generation, which had, of course, like really participated in founding the American colonies. Um, and then she goes on um, to expound 
um, to the effect that women's work is a misnomer um, and that if a woman would like to be a mother, a seamstress, a doctor, or a professional artist, you know, work is work. Um, and it goes on in this, in this very kind of like typical 19th century style of like moralizing fiction for, for quite a bit. But at the tail end, uh, we have Mr. Feeble running out of the door in horror, um, falling down the stairs, and then fainting on the sidewalk where he was taken by the people that saw this as a drunkard. So you're not going to probably be able to convince me that this story in Harper's Bazaar was not written by a woman. <laughs> it probably was. Um, it was unsigned, but you know, that's the gist of it. So why did I go into all of this? Well, this early mention of the modern woman in Harper's Bazaar in 1869 really kind of delineates the fact that many women at this time really desired agency outside of the home. You know, they, they craved this latitude to define their own lives. And increasingly, um, you know, the sentiment among um, upper middle class women who were largely had been in the past been expected to stay remain content to stay at home, raising children and managing household affairs. Well, you know, we start to see this shift is that, you know, maybe a life of domesticity isn't enough. And we will get to our couturiers in a moment, I promise. Um, but before we do, I'd also like to speak about the first mention of the modern woman in vogue. Um, and uh, Vogue um, is an American publication um, it, um, when it was first launched, um, and it was founded in 1892. But the first mention of the modern woman didn't come until the following year in Vogue, in 1893, when it was remarked that, quote, I always maintained that the smart modern woman never shows off better to her advantage than when well-mounted on a thoroughgoing hunter horseback, that's what they're referring to, perfectly habited, easy in seat, light of hand, alert, capable, determined to be in at the death of the hunt, um, hard enough to be able to stand a long day's spin over the roughest country, and yet turn up languid to the tips of her fingers at a regulation 845 dinner party. So What's really interesting about that particular reference to the modern woman in Harper's Bazaar um, in 1869 is it, it spoke solely to her livelihood or vocation, whereas now, fast forward another 30 years or so in Vogue in the, in the 1890s, um, and also, by the way, I should mention that Vogue was a society magazine at this time. Um, it really wasn't the fashion magazine that we all know today. Um, well, well, Vogue in this mention, you know, lauded this modern woman's progress as both a rugged sportswoman and also her ability to transform herself into this sort of swan yay social butterfly in just a matter of a few hours, right? And so dress is incredi like, incredibly central put to both of these roles expected of her. And, and this is exactly what we're looking at here, um, a writing habit from this time period, and also what um, it, you know, a very well-dressed woman might have worn to one of these um, evening events. So you know, in, in the years past, um, manners, charm, and elegance had really been the aspiration for many past generations of women. But now when we like add into this mix, the, the, the modern woman, what she's looking for, you know, she's expected to have aptitude, you know, spirit, and increasingly she craves freedom um, and the ability to move around the world as she sees fit. So, so on one hand, while we have this movement, um, you know, uh, of the modern woman, um, you know, what she was trying to do is perhaps traverse the era's social mores. Um, and, and so um, oftentimes this traversing the era's social mores happened on a corporeal level, like um, uh, as one's body moved through space. So we cannot really talk about this moving forward unless we talk a little bit about the history of the corset. So, um, the term corset is derived from a French word, corps, 
um, which also kind of means bodice. Um, and of course, as we all know, it more or less is an undergarment. It's typically boned, closed with laces that really kind of help shape and mold the wearer's body into whatever the fashionable silhouette was of that day. So for, for almost 400 years, um, the role of the corset remained largely unchanged. Um, it was literally and figuratively the garment upon which women's and sometimes even men's at certain time periods, um, you know, fashion was built. And um, within this time period, the waist was really the main focal point of the silhouette and also the point of support for the outer garments. Um, and, and no one person can really be credited with the invention of the corset, but it's generally believed that it emerged in the 16th century where it was first worn by aristocratic women and even their young daughters in the various courts of Europe. Um, here <laughs> we see a doll's corset from 1690. Like, so that's how, how, how prevalent it already was at this point in the 17th century um, that the, even the dolls were being corseted. Um, and, and on the right, you also see a frontispiece um, which is a little illustration um, from 1874, and it's from an anti-corseting treatise. Um, and what you see there in that illustration is on one hand, we have fashion, and on the other hand, we have vanity, and they are pulling the opposite um, um, ends of this corset laces. So the point I'm trying to get at is that Really from its inception, the corset was riddled with a lot of controversy. Um, some records from the 16th century indicate an almost immediate condemnation of, of this newly adopted garment at that time. Um, some reports even go so far as saying that extremely tight lacing uh, of the corset resulted in numerous deaths. Um, and, and I just have to mention this one, um, one of the more macabre anecdotes that I have read actually dates to 1581, um, when there was a surgeon whose name was Ambrose Poiré, and he claimed that a young woman, quote, being too bound and compressed in her wedding dress, came from the altar after having taken bread and wine in the accustomed manner, and um, thinking to return to her place, fell rigidly dead from suffocation. Um, but as uh, fashion historian Valerie Steele um, points out in her really wonderful book, The Corset of Cultural History, which I highly recommend. It's one of my all-time favorite fashion history books. Um, apparently, we find out that the, the young bride's mother soon remarried her recently deceased daughter's husband. So perhaps there were darker plots afoot, and it wasn't the corset that killed her, but maybe the, the food that she had just consumed. Um, but, but um, you know, throughout the corset's history, we see all these, like, cautionary tales always like following it around. So, um, you know, in the 19th century, not only did numerous physicians continue to claim that tight lacing resulted in body deformation and death, they also credited it with any number of other diseases, potentially including boiling blood, insanity, hysteria, melancholy, epilepsy, and then perhaps my personal favorite, ugly children. <laughs> So the, the, there was this, at this point, there was like this whole dress reform movement that emerged from the, specifically the health concerns that were swirling around corsetry and had been for centuries. So um, women by and large did not necessarily heed these doctors' warnings for, during those centuries. And there are a whole variety of reasons um, for this, which we're not gonna get into today because that is an entirely separate lecture. Um, but I think that we could let it suffice to say that because the corset had remained um, a fixture of women's dress for centuries, literally centuries, there was nothing particularly modern about women's clothing in the 19th century. And this continued to remain true all the way up until the very beginning of the 20th. So here we see two images of um, women getting dressed in their corsets. And I'd just like to point out that 100 years separates the creation of these two images. Um, so it really proves just how much uh, this aspect of dress had remained unchanged over the course of an entire century. So. With the dawn of the new, the, the new century, the 20th century, um, it brought a lot of um, 
an appetite for experimentation and change that really extended across the artistic spectrum. Um, this was especially true in the cultural hub of Paris, where um, at that point, everybody from architects to dancers to musicians and painters and interior decorators and even publishers were, were kind of like uh, seeking out a way to reinvent their um, work on the stage of this new century. And, and, and fashion, the field of fashion as an artistic uh, creative medium was no exception to this um, change. Um, it was really uh, during this first decade of the 1900s that after all these centuries of stagnation, um, that women's clothing finally underwent this very dramatic and rapid transformation. And this is when we can see uh, fashion and dress emerge that we can call modern. And it was really born at the hands of um, a whole host of various avant-garde fashion designers, um, you know, who increasingly created designs that were meant to be worn without a corset um, or, or made the wearing of a corset entirely optional. Um, and at the same time, we see um, the point of support where the weight of women's garments hang, we see that shift away from the corseted waist um, and, and we see that point of the weight now being at the shoulders. Um, and, and this is really one of the crowning hallmarks of modern fashion still to this day. And that is again, something to which our comfort um, now largely remains indebted. So um, in, in, the, in the decades preceding, um, when most of the famous names in fashion belong to men, um, we, we're talking about Charles Frederick Worth, Emile Bingat, uh, Jacques Doucet, you know, fashion had largely remained um, reliant on the corset to sculpt the female body. Um, it, uh, and then that is this understructure on which the clothes were then built. So, Perhaps it is not necessarily a coincidence um, that when we see a greater preponderance of female designers um, achieving the equal success um, as those that their male counterparts, that now also emerges this new emphasis in fashion on comfort, um, also ease of movement, and, and all of that really goes hand in hand with celebrating the body's natural form um, and, and grace. And I do want to point out, though, um, you know, however, there were a few men at the same time that were also thinking along these same lines. Um, and the images that we're looking at now um, depict uh, the work of Mario Fortuny y Madrazo. Um, but he actually would not enter the field of fashion until 15 years after this very first female couturier that we're going to discuss today, Jeanne Paquin. Um, and I find the fact that uh, the first reference that we see in Harper's Bazaar to the work of Jean Pancan um, occurs in 1869. I find that quite interesting because uh, Jeanne Marie Charlotte Beckers was actually born on the outskirts of Paris um, on June 23rd, 1869. So um, that, that, that first reference to modern woman, um, this was the year that she was born. Um, so she was really born into this world that was already primed for her future contributions in designing for the modern woman. And as a young woman, Jeanne worked at a local dressmaker's shop uh, before getting a job at Maison Roof, which was a prominent fashion house of the period. And it was walking to and from work at the Maison Roof that she was spotted by her future husband, Isidore Paquin, and he was immediately struck by her beauty. And the couple married just one month after opening uh, the Maison Paquin Couture House together in 1891. And uh, he was 28 and she was 21. And they were really very much uh, partners in the truest sense of the word. Uh, Isidore managed the administrative side of the business while Jeanne really served as the head designer. Um, and, and it should be noted that while Jeanne um, was the designer for the house in the early years of the business, sometimes in the fashion press, uh, uh, Isidore is cited as being the designer of the house, but this was not the case. Um, so in 1900, the House of Pacan was well established um, as a preeminent house, fashion house um, comparable with the likes of Worth and Doucet. 
And here we see a street scene um, depicting workers of the House of Akan exiting at the end of the day. And the House of Worth was actually located right next door. Um, and Jen's star was really on the rise um, in light of the fact that, that the, the master, the, the, the uh, you know, uh, accredited master, Charles Frederick Worth, he had actually passed away in 1895. So, the House of Worth, while it was still located next door and was still remained legendary um, and very much in vogue, it was under the direction of his two sons. Um, and uh, the Pekans um, kind of switched things up. They, they decided to open the doors of their couture house to clients deemed unworthy for appointments um, at this illustrious house of worth. And they personally greeted each client. Um, and, and it was really a lot of their warmth and personal attention that served um, these young entrepreneurs quite well and their business really blossomed. So, uh, Jen's mastery of color and her eye for layering fabrics and textures and um, the skillful nuance of her embellishments really earned the house a reputation as a leader for sophisticated French taste. Um, and it's, uh, this is a fact that's really underscored by Pacan's long list of affluent clients that included royalty from across Europe. And um, part and parcel to Jen and Isidore's tremendous success was also this keen business acumen and also a mastery of self-promotion. So um, there was this international exhibition that was held in Paris in 1900. And Jen, um, at 31 years old, was chosen to head the entire program for the fashion um, design exhibition and also to dress uh, a 20 foot statue that stood atop the building's um, exhibition opening and um, 20 foot that, that that's pretty large um, admirers could even order patterns for the statues dress um, that was published in a fashion periodical at the time and 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 um, it was called La Mode Illustrate but it was just one of many many fashion magazines of this era that really promoted Pacan as the last word in chic um, something else that they did that was interesting was they really harnessed the power of celebrity culture and they made sure to maintain um, high profile relationships with the era's leading actresses who wore their designs on and off stage. And they were also among the first fashion houses to send models um, and actresses to the racetracks to advertise and engage the reaction to their designs. So um, the racetrack at this time was very much the place to see and be seen. Um, and um, it was also within this network of this kind of master publicity machine that Jen successfully launched a new silhouette in 1905. And that's kind of what we're looking at here. Um, so in her winter collection, she revealed gowns um, as seen at the left um, in the forefront of this photograph that had narrowed skirts and the waistline had raised to just below the bust. Um, and note how the woman behind her with her hands on her hips, see how her waistline is like at the natural waist? Um, Pecan's model here is obviously so much higher. So um, Jen's new style was lauded in the fashion press as the new directoire or empire line, um, so-called because of the likenesses to styles of the directoire or Napoleonic empire period that followed immediately the French Revolution. So during this time, during the 18th and early 20th, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, during the 18th and early 19th centuries, um, during the directoire period, women had also similarly um, said goodbye to these really heavily constructed fashions um, supported by a corset in favor of a new high-waisted flowing chemise gown silhouette that was largely modeled on Greek and Roman dress. So um, today we still use this term empire or empire when we're referring to this high-waisted, you know, silhouette of a garment. So um, like Chanel, uh, after her, Jen was occasionally her own best model. Um, here we also see a 1906 painting by the artist Henri Gervais, which is entitled Five O'Clock at the House of Pacan. And um, it captures Jen's obviously very busy, bustling showroom. Um, you know, uh, she is featured here at the center in the dress with the purple skirt. 
um, you know, all of her staff and her clientele is around her. But it's only Jen in this image, if we look really closely, that is modeling this um, Empire, or Empire silhouette. You know, all of the ensembles of the women around her are kind of immediately made passe in comparison. You know, she was young, she was beautiful, she was an active working woman, and she really designed clothing that she herself would wear. So, you know, a lot of this clothing um, evolved along the principles of comfort and functionality that she really embraced. And these are really trademarks of modern dress, um, oftentimes credited to Chanel, but, you know, Pacan herself, who was born into this, you know, the, the early era of the modern woman, was also one of its early innovators. Um, so as fashion historian um, Jan Reeder has pointed out in some of her really groundbreaking work on Pacan, uh, it was really Jeanne's successful promotion of this neoclassical silhouette that laid the foundation um, for the acceptance of Paul Paré's more progressive designs um, seen at far right of a few years later. Um, and while Pacan's designs presented a fairly dramatic change in silhouette, um, her early models did still require a corset. Um, and she was always very careful to maintain this overall aesthetic that was in keeping with the realm of accepted good taste and respectability. Um, and the same can't not necessarily be um, said for Poiré, whose work sometimes was defined by its shock value. But um, as Reader points out, you know, Paré's genius was in grasping uh, the moment in time when a more radical rendition um, already of a silhouette that was already emerging would be accepted. And, and then he kind of took that and ran with it um, to this unparalleled flamboyance. So we're going to move on quickly here because I think I'm running behind on time. Um, but Jen's husband sadly died in 1907, and she ran the company by herself um, until partnering with her half-brother Henri Joir and his wife Suzanne in 1911. And really this trio um, kind of expanded the company to become a fashion empire with branches in London, New York City, Buenos Aires, um, and Madrid by 1914. And she also um, became the first woman in history to receive the prestigious Légion d'honneur award in commerce because of her very significant contributions um, to the economy of France. I'm going to skip over a little bit here. Um, but uh, she retired in 1920. Uh, four years later in 1924, it was declared that Madame Pacan in her day had exerted more authority over style than any other single person who had ever lived. Um, and and she's, she's quite cheeky. She remarried at the age of 62. She passed away in 1936. Um, but during these intervening years, she really carried on a lot of these philanthropic endeavors that she had been um, engaging with out through her through her life um, before she passed away. Um, ladies, I'm gonna go over. <laughs> we're just totally, we're, that's totally fine, April. Okay. We have, we're not we're not gonna we're not gonna go crazy over, but it, yep. it'll okay, cool. <laughs> um so um here we see um, a lovely exited example accompanied by the fashion plate um, that was advertising it at the same time. So this still exists. Um, and I think I'd like to just move on quickly to Jean Lavin. So um, Karl Lagerfeld called this next designer that we are going to discuss a great, great designer. And I've always thought that was not um, necessarily a bad compliment from the recently departed Karl Lagerfeld because he very rarely had anything nice to say about fellow designers. Um, um, as we all probably know, he was very infamous for his cutting and sometimes controversial um, commentary. But uh, Lavin um, uh, was two years older than Pacquiao. She was born in Paris in 1867. Um, and just like very many girls, um, working class girls during the 19th century, um, the path of employment and opportunity led her directly to the Parisian fashion trades. Um, and, and working in fashion was considered a very suitable line of work uh, for women at this time. And actually the industry um, disproportionately employed more women than a lot of other professions at this same time. And um, much of Lavin's training uh, took place under the tutelage of other female designers and milliners, um, including top 
Parisian millinery houses, Maison, uh, Maison Félix and also Susan Talbot. Um, so after a period of training for five years in Paris, 18-year-old um, Jeanne uh, Lavin spread her wings and she moved to Barcelona. And she, there she was employed by a very well-known Spanish dressmaker whose name was Maria Berta Valenti. And they became exceptionally close. They really considered them family for years on end. Um, and Valenti really nurtured Lavin's talents and she imparted her dressmaking expertise to her young protege. Um, Lavin then returned to France and she was quite skilled at couture construction techniques and she opened up a small millinery shop in her Paris apartment sometime around 1889 or 1890. Um, and it was really an afternoon attending the horse races um, that was going to prove a great turning point um, in Lavin's uh, life because there she met her future husband um, and uh, they married in 1896. They had a daughter. Her name was uh, Margaret Marie Blanche. Um, and the marriage failed, um, the, the couple did divorce, but what that love that did endure out of this relationship was really would go on to become this foundation um, for which the entire fashion empire was built on. Um, you know, she was a female designer, now single mother, um, and, and that is why she threw herself into building her millinery business um, as a means to support the two of them. And Marguerite, or Marie Blanche, as she's more commonly referred to, was really the light of her life. And one way that she expressed this love to her daughter was by creating these exquisite wardrobes um, of children's clothes. And well, so she was professionally more known as a hat maker, right? But all of her clients started paying attention to all this gorgeous children's wear that her daughter was dressed in. And then they began buying um, children's clothing from her. So um, it was in uh, 1909 that um, Lavin was officially welcomed into the ranks of the, the Parisian haute couture industry with lines for both women and also girls. And so uh, while the Lavin brand today is no longer still officially recognized as an haute couture house, it now does luxury ready to wear, but it was for many, many years um, the oldest couture house continuously operating in existence. And so from um, 1909 to 1993, so for 84 years, um, the Lavin brand remained one of the most uh, revered of the practicing couture houses. So it can be argued that um, this period of the 1920s and the 1930s was the heyday of Lavin. Um, the young, um, British princesses Elizabeth and Margaret actually wore Lavin's children's wear. Um, you know, even the princesses' dolls were sometimes dressed in Lavin because the couture house would create doll sized versions of the princesses' very special orders. Um, so it, it, it was just really incredible what she was achieving on both fronts, right? And, and many of Lavin's creations for women of this period really still retain this ability to take your breath away 100 years later because they still feel so modern. Um, you know, she had this really specific kind of purity of voice and vision in the clothes that she created. Um, and, and I distinctly remember years ago when I was at a museum exhibition and I was seeing the dress on the, on the, that you see here on the left and far across the room and I knew immediately that was Lanvin and it was. Um, and the embroidery and the beading on the dress are loosely inspired China, by Chinese motifs. Um, and this is something that she was able to do quite well um, to kind of seek out inspiration from other cultures and draw on these vast wellsprings of beauty, but she did it in a way that was that changed up that narrative. And, and she worked in a way that, um, you know, really kind of avoided those pitfalls of cultural appropriation. Um, and the dress that you see on the right um, is actually inspired by um, dress traditions of Northern Africa. Um, it's using a Moroccan crepe textile and the pattern um, of beading kind of evokes these geometries that we often see in Islamic art. Um, but she named the dress geranium. So it kind of adds this other additional level of meaning by pointing out the pattern's floral qualities as well. And so this is, this is what I'm kind of talking about. She was quite adept at um, integrating these cultural inspirations in a way that was uniquely fresh and uniquely her own. Um, 
And so while Avant did occasionally look abroad for inspiration, um, most frequently her inspiration was really found right at home um, in the form of her own daughter, uh, Marie Blanche. And, and um, she did go by Marie Blanche, but I don't think we can entirely uh, dismiss the Marguerite Marie Blanche, the Marguerite part of her name, because it does have a very specific tie to the iconography of the house. Um, in French, uh, Marguerite means daisy. Um, so it's no accident that the daisy frequently appears in, in, in the La Vain oeuvre as a, as a pattern or embellishment. Um, and Marie Blanche um, played an integral role in the development of the La Vain brand. Um, she was, of course, um, her mother's, you know, muse from the moment she was born. Um, and as Marie Blanche grew up, so also followed the evolution of the La Vain style. So, you know, from toddler muse um, to then aristocrat and model. Um, during the 1930s, Marie Blanche can be spotted in the fashion magazines, as we see here on the right, modeling her mother's designs um, in the pages of Vogue. Um, and um, even after she married um, and became the Countess of Polignac. So, um, Despite helming such a high profile company, um, Jen herself really shied away from the limelight. Um, she, you know, she preferred a quiet but creative life with her daughter at the center. Um, and, and oftentimes her creations were named over the years Marie Blanche because she was always in her mother's heart, which makes perfect sense then why the logo of the House of La Vain um, would be a very tender testament to this exceptional bond between mother and daughter. Um, and in 1923, the avant-garde um, illustrator Paul Arib created this logo for the house that you see here, which was based on this photo um, of the two of them where they were dressed for a fancy dress ball or, or costume party, as we would say. Um, so while La Vanne is also well known for these mother-daughter styles, perhaps she is best known for her robe to steel. Um, and in, in her own words, um, she said, modern clothes need some sort of romantic quality. Um, and to this effect, she created what were also called picture dresses with skirts that are kind of supported by these wire supports at either hip. And this is a direct reference um, to the 18th century um, uh, gowns which were supported by panniers or these structures made of cane or wire that were tied about the waist. Um, and one of the things that's really notable about um, Lanvin's Robe de Steel is that a lot of times they were personalized for each client. Um, so some of the embellishments might include a, a client's favorite hobby um, or even a pet. Um, and, and these gowns are really kind of, you know, the epitome of her take on modern clothing and this romance that she is imbuing into her clothing um, by way of personal references, um, but also the silhouettes and color palettes of a bygone era. And so one of the other things that Lena was really well known for um, was her unique colors. And in 1923, she launched her own dye factory to uh, basically cater to her, her own um, requirements from unique colors. She was a lot of, she was friends with a lot of very famous painters of the era, and including she was in a relationship with one as well. Um, so art um, played, you know, a, a, a deep role um, in, in these color palettes that she was creating. And, um, you know, she had colors like Rose Polignac, which is, of course, named after, uh, named for uh, Marie Blanche after she got married, uh, Velasquez Green, a direct reference to art. Um, and, and a lot of these color palettes, like we see here, were never able to be uh, replicated by her competitors. Um, so Jen, um, again, much like Pacan, garnered a lot of illustrious awards over the course of her career. She also won the Légion d'Honneur Award. Um, here we see um, an extant example um, as exhibited in 1939, and then it's still remaining in a museum collection. Um, but uh, Lavin passed away in 1946 at the age of 79. And at that time, um, Marie Blanche uh, took the helm of the company for a very short period um, uh, before ultimately was turned over um, to be directed by Antonio Castillo in 1950. Um, and he was a Spanish designer, actually, that came to Paris to, to work with the Lavin Couture House. And I just want to raise another point before we move on to VNA, which I'll do quickly. Um, and, and that is that, well, Paris has historically been this epicenter of the haute couture trades that um, the players in the game have always hailed from around the globe. So 
Castillo, Spanish took over, Balenciaga, Spanish, and you know, Charles Frederick Worth, who is really considered to be the father of oak couture, was English. So it's always been an international game. Um, okay. So the next designer um, I'm going to speak about really flourished um, in this international milieu of the fashion industry. She was French, but she received her training abroad in, in London. And uh, Madeleine Vionnet was born in Chilo of Bois, France in 1876. And she's kind of known as the architect among dressmakers. Um, and she began working um, in the clothing industry at a very impressionable age of 11 years old. Um, at 18, she was briefly married to a man with whom she had a child. The child passed away very sadly in infancy. Um, and then the marriage ended a short time after. And at that time, she moved to London, um, where she found a job working for the um, one royal court dressmaker, maker, Kate Riley. Um, and then um, it was really under her, her tenure of working under the Callot Sir, which was another female-led couture house in Paris, um, where she started in 1900, that she really began to hone her skills, um, learning the art of draping directly on the body. Um, and, and working under Madame Gerber, who was one of the Callot Sirs, one of the Callot sisters, um, she became aware of creation and craftsmanship. And she said, today I make Rolls Royces where without Madame Gerber, I would have made Fords. <laughs> this is a much, much so cited um, quote from um, about her work. But um, in 1907, Vionnet um, made another change in employment and went to work for Jacques Doucet. And um, here um, she, um, I would like to note too that Poiret also had worked for Doucet earlier in the decade. The two of them never crossed paths while working at Doucet, um, but they were very much nonetheless aligned in their concert, concept of modern fashion and what it meant to be modern. Um, and Vionnet was quite peeved when Poiret claimed quite loudly to be the first designer to abolish the corset um, because she claimed herself that it was her she who abolished the corset in 1907 um, and saying, I presented mannequins for the first time with bare feet and sandals. And what, when we say mannequins, we mean models, professional models. Um, and in another interview, she even said, I have never been able to tolerate corsets myself. So why would I have infl inflicted them on other women? Um, and some of uh, Vionnet's designs while she was designing under Doucet were really inspired by um, the avant-garde modern dancer Isadora Duncan, who we see here, and, and who wore these barely there costumes um, based on styles of dress depicted in, um, in ancient art. Um, so these <laughs> collections that she did for Doucet uh, were quite scandalous. Um, the Doucet sells women refused to show them. Um, and basically Vionnet realized quickly that um, to have complete control over, over her design process, she was going to have to open her own design house, which she did in 1912. Um, the house briefly closed at the outbreak of World War I. Um, but it reopened at the end of the war with this renewed emphasis on the classical ideals of dress. And that would really become this mainstay of Vionnet's uh, design philosophy. And here um, we see the logo of the house, um, which was created by the artist and Vionnet collaborator, Teot. Um, and then this figure, you know, is a per perched on this iconic uh, um, ionic column. Um, and that's really underscoring her alignment with these antique notions of the body and how, how it should be draped. And then the dress that we see here um, at, um, on the other side was produced five years later. And it's really taking direct inspiration from the, the logo of the house. So um, where the fashionable silhouette um, had kind of moved on um, from the high-waisted neoclassical silhouette of the pre-war era, um, Vionnet continued to explore this relationship between fabric and the body, and eventually she went on to master the art of the bias cut. Um, and th th she's exceptionally famous for this. Um, and this method, of course, if you don't already know, involves cutting fabric across the grain on a diagonal. Um, so it really emphasizes cling and the drape qualities of the fabric stretch. Um, and and uh, Cecil Beaton, who was an ardent uh, Vionnet admirer, called women dressed by Vionnet um, moving sculptures, um, which, which I've always thought 
was so lovely. And Vionne herself says that one of her main goals was to liberate the female, female form. Um, and she says, I've proved that there is nothing more graceful than the sight of material hanging freely from the body. Um, and so, you know, in the hands of Vionne, something as simple as, you know, material hanging from the body became increasingly intricate. Um, and she thought of herself um, as not as haute couturier, but as a dressmaker. Um, and, and here we see um, some of um, examples of the similar style of dress and then the pattern that actually went into making them. Um, and um, even in the employees of her own um, dressmaking establishment said that Vionnet didn't regard herself as a, as a couturier or a designer, but as a technician. Um, and this really kind of stresses like how important construction um, was um, in her work. And she used these incredibly complex geometries in her jar garments um, that, are, that are, are the result of um, draping in the round. And she famously used a little uh, miniature dress form. Um, and, and then the full size garments would be scaled up from these little miniature ones that she would create. Um, in the round. Um, I just want to point out this dress really quick. It's one of my all-time favorites of hers. Um, of course, this is sheer, so something would have been worn underneath this, but the entire thing is hand-pieced. These little tiny little hexagons, each one a complete different shape and size in order to sculpt the dress to the body. And, and this is what we're talking about, how, you know, this dress really illustrates like uh, she was a true virtuoso, you know, of how she worked in three dimensional space and not only, um, you know, her dedication to craftsmanship. Um, same with this dress, which is technically a piece of cut work. Um, so all these little triangles that you see were actually removed from the fabric um, individually, and then the little edges are overcast by hand um, um, with a stitch. This actually, we have this at the museum at FIT, it was on exhibition recently, um, you know, and, and this is a centuries old technique, but you know, to us today where we can have like laser cutting that could potentially do the same thing, um, this, is, this is just another, another example of the, of the, you know, the sheer amount of labor that went into this dress. It's, it's really eye inspiring. Um, so I'm almost done. <laughs> uh, Vianney was a pioneer, um, not only in matters of technique and craftsmanship, but her goddaughter um, later after the fact after she passed called her a feminist to the very depths of her soul. Um, and she also stands out among her contemporaries for her really progressive labor practices. Um, she provided her, um, uh, her employees with health care and also maternity leave. Um, and much like Pacan, who also had been involved in a very disastrous early marriage, Vionnet uh, remarried a bit later in life um, at the age of 47. And I just get a big kick out of this because he was 18 years younger than her. Um, and she says that they made quite an affair of this marriage. And she's like, I got a young man, he was 29, and he became a little bit richer. <laughs> So um, he, was a shoe, he was a shoe designer, so I think that really, um, you know, cemented the bond between them two. Um, so, you know, uh, the story of the House of Vionne today, Vionne today is not over. Um, the, the brand was revived in 2006, and Vionne really kind of jo joins this growing roster of historic fashion brands, which have been uh, relaunched or reemerging, including uh, Scaparelli and also Poiret. Um, La Vin never closed its doors. It's not a uh, Oak Couture House anymore, but it is remains one of the oldest continuously operating fashion brands. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'd like to end our talk today. Um, I, I hope that you've learned a little bit something today about um, a few of the designers, the business women, the wives, the mothers that helped shape modern fashion. And, you know, just before we quit, I just want to say that, you know, I don't, I don't want to leave out and acknowledge the myriad of women that came before them who were also exceptionally talented dressmakers. Um, you know, the names of designers like Madame Camille or Madame uh, Palmyra um, are kind of lost to history, um, to even to some of us professional fashion historians. But um, 
I think there's a lot of scholarship left to be done that can reveal the stories of these women that came before them um, as well. So, um, you know, and also too, just like, you know, uh, these stories and this voice is something that we all continue to do today every time that we all get dressed. So thank you so much. I'm sorry I went over a little bit, <laughs> but um, if we have time, um, I'm definitely happy to answer questions. We have a couple of questions, just a few. Thank you so much. I think we yeah. were all just so into the presentation that we didn't even realize the time. So <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, we'll, we'll ask, we have a couple of questions. We'll, we'll send your way uh, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, the first one is in relation to comfort and less wearing of the corset and the emphasis on the shoulder uh, with the empire waist, why did the girdle and the long line bra exist through the 50s? Ah, yes. Okay, so just because these like more modern styles were emerging, things didn't totally change overnight, right? And so when we were looking at some of those um, garments uh, from the 1930s, specifically the Vionnet ones, the satin ones that were super body clinging, there had to be some sort of support under there, right? And so that's when we see um, things like the girdle. And also this also happens in um, context of like the evolution of technology, right? So when elastic and some of those things come out, we see this major shift in the undergarment. So it's no longer boned and corseted, but there's still something under there giving some support, right? Mm -hmm. Just yeah. like nowadays, we have the invention of, of the spandex. Yeah. And everyone that knows of Spanx. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, do we know any of the names of the staff who worked with Viognier and actually did the piecing and cut work to create the fabrics that she used to create the pieces that you showed toward the end of your presentation? Um, I'm not exactly sure of specific names, but I can direct you to a really wonderful source um, to investigate this further. And I haven't looked at this book in maybe a bit, um, but it's by Betty Kirk. Um, and it is this amazing examination of her construction techniques and those patterns um, that I showed in my presentation are ones that she actually took herself from extant garments. Um, so um, if there's anywhere that probably gets into that, it's definitely Betty Cook's book, so. It's a fantastic resource. And we will follow up with some resources uh, and an email with the recording of this later. So we can definitely add that in there. Uh, let's see, we've got just two more. What is the, what is your opinion of the fashion houses that try to revitalize themselves? Viognier, Scaparelli, and Lanvin after Albert Abbas. Abbas? It is rough. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, I think it's really hard to like, you know, continue on like moving forward from some of these just really iconic brands that had reshaped how we all dress today. Yeah. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, you know, people that are, you know, clinging on to the name recognition, but do I see that same sort of like um, rapid progress or innovation? Um, usually not. Um, and I have to say both Poiré and Scaparelli are two of my all-time favorite designers. I was so excited when Scaparelli relaunched. But the thing about, thing that seems lacking to me about that is like for Scaparelli, you know, clothes were, she never considered herself beautiful. She considered herself quite ugly. So clothes for her were almost like a woman's armor against the world. And so I think that because there's, since it relaunched, it's only been male designers that were helming Scaparelli. I think they're going to have to bring in a female designer before they're going to be able to hit that right note, right? Right. Uh, there, there's a photographer who, who has a famous quote that about that, how fashion is women's armor for the everyday. All right, our last question. Uh, this is from Claire. I get how Paquin and Vianney helped style a modern woman by innovating the silhouette, working toward a more natural body. Lanvin, while a modern woman herself and in influential couturier, doesn't seem like she quite fits into the mold uh, because of, she's known for the robe de steel, which is historicizing and potentially required more cumbersome supports. Is that correct? And if so, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I would agree with you on that front. Um, you know, it's much the same argument saying like um, that, uh, 
what Christian Dior did when he did, did the new look and, and all of that is kind of like going back um, and looking back towards her historic silhouettes. But I, well, well, she is, she is well known for the robe de steel. It's not all she made. Um, so there is this whole other breadth uh, of her body of work that, that does fit in within that like comfort and modernism. The robe de steel, you know, maybe a little bit of an aberration for that, but we also can't speak about her without, without mentioning it. Right. It's the most famous yeah. thing, but also only one part of what she did. We actually have a robe de steel in the collection mm -hmm. at the Island Center for History and Culture, and even like the little hip support that they wore. Uh, we have one from the 18th century, but then also at the 1920 uh, era when she would wear them. So we have a little 1920 uh, panier, which is, is super fun. So I think that is all that we have nice. time for today. Uh, we hope that everyone really enjoyed this program. Uh, we love having our fashion people here and this community is so fantastic. We can't thank you enough for all of your support. Uh, if you haven't had enough of fashion yet, we will be back here tomorrow, same time, same place, to do a panel discussion on sustainable fashion. It is hosted by Dr. Victoria Pass, and there are three panelists, including myself, as well as Valeska Popola, Janice from DC Sustainable Fashion, and Caprice Ann Jackson. So please join us for that tomorrow, and I will be turning the MC hosting duty over to my better counterparts tomorrow, so <laughs> stepping back into the panelist role. Please let us know if you have any questions, and we will try and get them to April for you. Thank you all. Thank you, April, so much for being with us today. We appreciate it so much. Thank and I you can't for joining. The next episode of Dressed. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.